Thank you very much. Uh, I thought I was going to get away with sitting down and having a conversation. Uh, thank you. I think first just to say briefly, because uh, people in Ireland think they know who I am, and at least people who are not from Ireland know that they don't. <laughs> so uh, I've spent all of my adult life in campaigning for something, and that something has changed its name. It's always been the same thing, but language changes. And so when I was, when I was a young student and, and actively campaigning for a better world, for fairness, uh, for an end to injustice and unkindness, and what I saw as a young person to be the first response of government at every point of criticism to be to repress the critical voice, to silence the opposition. And as a young student, I became involved in challenging that in the northern part uh, of this country, separated historically by partition in the development and demise of the British Empire. So from, from the 1920s, this small island has been partitioned, uh, part of it being a free state and then a republic, independent sovereign republic, and the northern part still being uh, a strange phenomenon that is neither a colony nor a dominion uh, nor a region, uh, but is an integral part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Impossible for many to understand that in 1968, when all students became and all young people became revolting, great, great times to be young, in Northern Ireland we did not have equal access to the democratic vote. And this wasn't in Africa, this wasn't in South America, this was in uh, what I would call the belly of the beast. This was right in the heart of the United Kingdom. <clears throat> and the people who didn't have votes were poor people. It wasn't that Catholics didn't have votes or uh, rural people didn't have votes. Basically, if you didn't own your own property, you didn't have a vote uh, at, at municipal and local government level where all the power was held. And if you did own property, you had a vote for every unit of property that you held in which somebody lived. That was 1968. That's only 50 years ago inside the United Kingdom. So that's what I started at, at the age of 1920 uh, to campaign around. And in my own defense, I wish to say, I got to be a member of parliament by accident. <laughs> uh, I never chose it as a career path. My own journey was throughout that whole civil rights movement and because of the context in which we lived, because of the response of the state, because of the heavy weight of our historic relationships and the way we understood struggle, that mass peaceful movement drifted by accident, by consequence, almost inevitably, but never by conscious design, into a violent, conflict with the state, then into intercommunal conflict, and then into war. Whether you call it war, political violence, terrorism, it doesn't really matter. It's that situation in which people get killed in conflict and in which a moral compass that works in peacetime ceases to operate and, and people work under a war, what I call war logic. 
and war logic allows us all to readjust our moral compass so that what our people do is something that has been pushed upon us, is something about which we have no choice, really, but what the other people do is violent, is massacre, is cruel, is inhuman. And it takes a long time to get back out of that way of thinking when, when a war is over. Thank you. So right through that period, uh, I continued to be active. Right through that period, I continued to be active. Uh, I was a member of Parliament. People remember me in Parliament mostly for hitting a government minister. <laughs> I, you see, such is the nature of democracy that all around the world people applaud when you say, I committed an act of violence against a democratic leader of the state. But, but the, the reason for that was that uh, I wasn't allowed to exercise my right as a member of parliament to inform the House about a massacre that had been carried out by the British Army. And it took 38 years of campaigning to get the truth of Bloody Sunday. Uh, I'm not going to that whole long, sad tale of how I got to, to where I am today. But inevitably, the conflict, the war, had to come to an end by negotiation. Wars only end in one of two ways. The opposition is annihilated, and people are oppressed, and the stages for the next war is already set. Or war, no matter how long it takes, no matter how violent it is, ends in negotiation to bring a war to an end. And usually, for no finer reason than people have fought each other to exhaustion. And then they go back to looking at some better way to work. So the peace process in Northern Ireland was being developed, and, and I put my hand up again. I have always wanted peace. If you're not from Ireland and anybody tries to sell you the Northern Ireland peace process model, decline. <laughs> they thank you very much, but I think we could improve on that. At that point, I had a serious concern about how the peace was being negotiated. It has been negotiated, not again by design, but by default, to create an impression that something about the war at least had the merit in bringing people to the table. It did not. The Northern Ireland peace process and Northern Ireland peace settlement was on the table in 1972. British government put the terms of the peace on the table in 1972. And in 1998, everybody settled for what was on the table in 72. And a little less. So a question we have to all ask ourselves is, what was the period in between about? So a number of people like myself said at a very local sense of community of place because we thought this process had flaws built into it and somewhat prophetically we said it could only really last about 15 to 20 years. We've had the 10th anniversary of the peace process and we are now a year and a half without any government in the north of Ireland at all tell you something else. Communities and society can function without government. <laughs> government cannot function without communities and society. That power balance is wrong. Government is the servant of society, not, not the other way around. So we started in our small community of place to say we have to begin right at neighbourhood level again and build the peace between ourselves, all of us. 
and build the kind of community of place that recognises its diversity. Now, at that point, the diversity of Northern Ireland couldn't really be written with a capital D or even a small d. It was a very, it had the appearance of a very homogenous society. Most of the people in it had never been off the island and quite a large number of them had never been to Belfast, which is 50 miles down the road. So small islands have small people, have small visions sometimes. We put together a model not because we read it in a book and thought, we'll try that. We started at the ground discussing amongst ourselves how we would make this work. How do we make room for each other? And how do we recognise that when we build our alliances along the baseline, that the problems we have are actually up here? So when we're not talking about Catholics and Protestants coming together to forgive each other for things they didn't do in the first place, things that happened way back here. We realised there are other communities. There are communities of people with disability. There are communities of women. There are communities of children. There are communities of people who are poorer than everybody else. So we put together what we call the South Tyrone Empowerment Programme to empower ourselves. One of the big opportunities that came from the peace was that very small time later, because we had a big injection of tsunami of money from Europe to build the peace, it was the economy that recovered. And we didn't have, we had a community that had been ravaged by war. People didn't know. People actually were too traumatised to go to the factory and do seven and a half hours work every day. People, you forget that. You can't easily just because the war's over, forget everything and say, oh yes, I have to work a 40-hour week in order to pay my debts. I can go back tomorrow and do that. So we sent, it's important to know this, the community sent to the global community for people to come into our community and help us to rebuild the economy. We discovered then and the way I thought about it was, you know the old-fashioned ringers where you put, you put wet clothes through them and you wring them and then the dry clothes come out at the other side and the water's left here. We realised, we being the group that we were forming, that our brothers and sisters from the rest of the world who came to help us to do this work were having their labour rung through the ringer and their humanity squeezed out of them. So we wanted their work. We wanted their cheap labour. But we didn't want them to be the same. We didn't want them to be the same as ourselves. Our local government started to talk about what migrant workers had what rights. People came and as soon as they arrived, others were asking, how long are you staying? First question you get asked when you arrive is hardly welcoming. So we put our model of working to the test and said, if we said this is a community of place, and our starting point was, regardless of how you got to be here or where your starting point is, if you are here, you belong here. And, and we then work around an equality uh, and a solidarity around that. And it stood the test of time. And so we began to, to build that neighbourhood solidarity with our new immigrant labour. The, the, the war, not our war, but the wars in the Middle East, the problems of people in Palestine, the Syrian war, the Iraq war, but mostly following on, on Libya and then the, the Syrian war, we became aware of new people trying, trying to get out of war. And our local governments and our government saying, you can't come in here. So we started again and said, yes, yes you can. There's room here. The population of Ireland in total has not recovered from the famine. We are still roughly, 
in this small island, a million people short of a loaf. <laughs> this loaf of bread, which is Ireland, is a million slices short of a population. So there's room here for everybody. So that's, that's the kind of work that began, we began to do, which took us into this field that is called community development. So people ask, what's Bernadette doing now? She's lurking, <laughs> lurking in community development. Uh, and that's what, that's what the government says. That's what, what people who know. She's certainly not up to anything good. <laughs> and, and so I ask myself, because I get frustrated, what am I doing lurking in community development? What are we all doing lurking in community development if we aren't systematically working towards real social change? And our conference today is about participation, power, and progress. And in community development, we're getting participation right. We're getting that right. We're doing the engagement. We're doing the building along the bottom. Where I'm not so sure we're getting it right is that in order to build it along the bottom, in order to make elbow room, in order not to wound the tiger till we're ready, we are forgetting the question of power. And the question of power has to be addressed because the people who have no power are the people we're working with. Or that is no power that can be exercised within the system the way it's organized. Because the response of government is still to repress criticism. But sometimes I ask myself, have we forgotten the hard side of peacemaking, which is not always just about ending war? And are we becoming pacified? Pacified by government partnerships? Are we becoming pacified by funding criteria? Mm -hmm. I remember when you, know, you looked out and you saw something was wrong and you went and tried to see somebody else who would give you a hand to do something about it. Now you look up Grant Tracker <laughs> to see who will pay you to put a poster or a brick through the government's window. <laughs> and I can assure you, whatever about posters, nobody's funding bricks. <laughs> so for me, I think what I'm looking at is when we're talking about broadening democracy and participative democracy around decision makings, we have to challenge the core questions that come up today. One, we are all told there's not enough money in the system. Yes, there is. And if there's not, it's because our governments will not take it of the people who have far too much of it and who are the cause of most of our misery, take it off them and process it to the people who need it. We have got to start democratizing wealth. And when we talk about participative democracy, unless we're beginning to talk about democratizing wealth, we are always going to be lurking in community development. There is a, another problem that I think that we have to face. I've done a number of those to wear me out, which is why I'm so glad to be here. Nostalgic trips on 1968. It's 50 years from 1968, and it's 10 years from the peace treaty. So people are organizing look-back meetings. 1968 was all over the world for a whole lot of reasons. An, out, an outbreak of popular movements of progress and movements of radicalization and movements to the left. 2018, 
is a parallel movement of the right. Right across the world. Right across the world. The populist right is rising. Right across the world, the narrative of division and fundamentally that line that ends in fascism. Not saying that we're there, but we are where that begins. We are where that begins. We have a president in America that we are excusing his behavior on the grounds he may be mentally ill. (laughs) He may be a puppet for somebody else. He may just be an idiot. He is nonetheless the President of the United States. And he is, at this point, fueling and encouraging the rise of the right and of the seeds of fascism in his own country. We look to the United Kingdom. We look to the last throw of the dice to restore a dying empire in a unilateral right-wing move out of the European Union. We look within the European Union at a fortress Europe that is building its walls against people fleeing wars that Europe and America created in those people's countries. Now, if community development and people working in community development have nothing to say about that, we would need to go home.